Hey, welcome to Bear Academy. I'm your host, Bear, a product designer, living in New Zealand. A few years ago, when I self-started product design (UX), the most challenging thing at that time was to memorize and understand those UX and product terminologies because there are a lot of terminologies I need to remember. And、uh, they are essential because I'm going to use it in my job or during the job interviews. So yeah,、uh, that was challenging. For example, what is Lean UX? What is Agile? What is user stories? What is、uh, quantitative research? What is、um, like、uh, conversion rate or other things? So everything is get connected. In the later stage, but at the very beginning of my design career journey as a product designer, it was the most challenging thing、uh, for me. So at that time, I tried to learn it like uh, uh, in the old traditional way. I used sticky notes, write out those, write down those terminologies, created、uh, flashcards,、uh, and put things put notes everywhere to help me remember.、Uh, it works well. But now, with support from AI, I think we can do a much better job. So today, I did an experiment、um, to create a conversation style、uh, of learning assets,、um, so that if you are on the same boat with me as me a few years ago, like、uh, just start to learn those、uh, UX terminologies, this will be for you. Uh, how to do that? How to use it? Basically, I use Google's、um, tool, Notebook LM, to create conversational podcast or audio、uh, with those regards to those、uh, UX terminologies. So it included、um, some basic terminologies、uh, for product designer, product managers. And the source is from Nielsen Norman Group, which is the、um, like this authority in UX field. So basically,、uh, everything I've created is sourced from from that place. So how to use it? Basically, you just、uh, start to listen to this podcast with、um, uh, with the audio with this conversation、uh, after, and then.、Uh, Try to understand. Try to、uh, try to memorize those things. But also, I、uh, recommend to go to the source websites, Nielsen Norman Group's website, to check those uh, original uh, articles so that you can understand them properly. And also, in the show notes, I also、uh, add the link. Oh, sorry, the description, the brief description, the brief、uh, explanation of、uh, those terminologies. So yeah, have a look, and if you have any questions, just reach out to me on LinkedIn or uh, on uh, Twitter uh, X. Uh, my name is、uh, my hashtag. Uh, my hand,、uh, sorry, my handle is、uh, Bear Big or Bear Liu. So yeah, you can you can find me there. Right, I think that's the short brief. Now let's get into it. Okay, so today we're gonna. Deep dive into this whole agile thing. Agile, yeah. You know, we've got like、yeah. articles and case studies, and、mm-hmm. even like internal notes. We've got a ton of stuff. Like a whole library on agile. Yeah, it's a lot. And you know,、yeah. I'm a designer, so、right. I'm always looking for ways to, yeah, you know, smooth out the process. So for sure. And as a product manager,、yeah. I mean, it's something that you absolutely need to know. Right.、It's、really popular in tech. Yeah. But to be honest with you, the ideas, yeah, can really be applied to like. Any time project. So we're not building like bridges、oh. or spaceships today. Yeah, exactly. But the the logic still applies. Yes, the Agile Alliance defines it as. Okay. Agile is the ability to create and respond to change. Okay. It's all about succeeding when things are unpredictable. Yeah. Which, let's be real. Yeah. That happens in every project. Oh yeah. Tell me about it.、Yeah. Designs change, client feedback. Right. You know, throws a curveball. So how how does Agile actually help us、mm-hmm. deal with all that? Well, think about those crazy design sprints we do. Yeah. We focus on one thing <laughs> and get it done. Yeah. 
And then we adapt based on what we learn. Right. I mean, that's agile in action. Like mini projects. Yeah. Inside the bigger project. Exactly. Keeps us from getting lost in the weeds. Right. And we're constantly getting feedback, yeah, right? Absolutely. And, yeah. you know, one of the agile principles is okay. customer collaboration over contract negotiation. Okay. So we are constantly getting feedback. We're adapting. Yeah. Right. And it leads to better outcomes. Yeah. Instead of getting, like, locked into a rigid plan, yeah. we're kind of collaborating mm -hmm. and adjusting. Totally. Which has got to be better for everyone. Absolutely. So speaking of collaboration, okay. let's talk about Scrum. Okay. Scrum. You familiar with that? Yeah. Yeah. It sounds intense, like a no. rugby match or something. But it's just a framework for... Yes. For working together. A hundred percent. Right. Thinks, thinks a frame, events, and tools that help us stay organized. Okay. Remember that project we had? Yeah. Where we had a dedicated Scrum master? Oh, yeah. They were like our coach they're awesome keeping us on track yeah clearing any roadblocks they kept everything running smoothly <laughs> yeah. made sure we were always communicating yep i think that project actually shipped on time see it works yeah and don't forget about the product owner right the voice of our users okay. making sure we're building the right thing huh. and then there's us right the design and development team yes bringing it all to life bringing it all to life <laughs> okay i'm seeing how it comes yeah. together yeah what about kanban okay is that like Scrum's cousin or it's something? Kind of. Yeah. Canfin is less about the team structure and more about visualizing the workflow. Okay. Imagine a giant whiteboard with columns to do designing development done. Okay. Each task is like a sticky note moving across as we work on it. So I can literally see exactly. where everything is yeah. at a glance. Keeps things transparent. Right. Helps you spot bottlenecks. I love a good visual. Yeah. Yeah. Now, both Scrum and Kanban, okay. they borrow from lean manufacturing. Lean manufacturing. Ever heard of that? Vaguely. Okay. It's all about efficiency, right? Exactly. Okay. Lean thinking is about eliminating waste. Okay. And maximizing value. All right. Making sure every step yeah. adds something real okay. for the customer. No busy work. No busy work. All right. Okay. So connecting all these dots, Yeah. what are the big wins with Agile? Well, flexibility is huge. Okay. Things change. Right. Agile lets us roll with it. Yeah. And it forces us to collaborate more. Okay. Which means right. better communication and teamwork. That makes sense because uh, we're constantly getting feedback so the end product should That's, be better. Yes, 100%. Yeah. Okay. And ideally, we're getting things done faster. Okay. Less time wasted. Yes. More value delivered. We should Sounds like a dream come true. Right. But I'm guessing it's not all sunshine and roses. It's not. So what are some of the challenges? Well, Agile requires commitment from everyone. Okay. You need a team that's willing to be open. Right. Communicate constantly yeah. and adapt to change. So it's a mindset shift. Exactly. Not just a new project yeah. management app. 100%. And you need to be careful about scoop creep. Scope creep. Since Agile is all about being flexible, right? sometimes projects can grow yeah. beyond their original scope okay. if you're not careful. Yeah. That's where a good product owner comes in, right. keeping things focused. All right. So for you listening in right now, yes. think about a project that went sideways. Mm -hmm. Could an Agile approach have helped? It's yeah. the most of tighter feedback loops, yeah. more flexibility. That's the question to ponder. Yeah. And remember, Agile isn't a one-size-fits-all solution. Okay. It's a journey. Yeah. of continuous learning and adaptation. Right. Keep experimenting and find what works best okay. for you and your team. Awesome. Yes. <laughs> Ever find yourself like totally lost in some app, uh -huh. you know, clicking all over the place, just trying to figure out how to do the simplest thing? Oh, all the time. It drives me nuts. Yeah. It's like, hello, bad user experience. Yeah, bad UX. UX in action. Yeah. So today, we're going to dive into this really interesting conversation between mm -hmm. uh, Bear, he's a product designer, okay, and Kat, a product manager. Mm -hmm. And they're just chatting about UX and why it matters, uh, even you... if you know, you're know you not like a tech wizard. Yeah. I mean, like we've it. all had those moments. Perfectly. <laughs> like you said, just totally lost in a nap, clicking around like crazy. Right. Exactly. So what's really cool about this conversation is that they start talking about how... Um, how important it is for product teams, you know, developers, designers, everybody to be on the same page about basic UX terminology. Yeah, you would think that's like a given, right? You would think. 
But, you know, so often we assume everyone's working from the same definitions, and it turns out yeah. they're not. So when you said they're speaking different languages almost. Totally. And that's a recipe for, you know, a product that nobody wants to use. Exactly, yeah. There's this one part where um, Kat has this, like, light bulb moment. Oh, yeah, yeah. Where she realizes that she and Bear aren't even on the same page about what, like, UX even means. Yeah, it's like one of those... Uh, aha moments. Yeah, the aha moments. Light that's, bulb. Right. And it just highlights why having that shared language is so critical. Like, it seems obvious, but then you think about it and it's like... Totally. Oh, right. If we're not speaking the same language, yeah. how are we going to make a product? It's like if you were trying to, I don't know, bake a cake with someone. Yeah. And you thought flour meant like sugar. Right. Oh, my God. He'd end up with a disaster. Yeah, that would be yeah, that'd be a crumbly mess. So total crumbly mess. So, okay, we've got this aha moment. And it's about language. Yeah. Let's break down some of these uh, these UX terms okay. that Bear and Cat are talking about. Yeah, let's get specific. Starting with, well, UX, right? Like, what, yeah. what does that actually mean? Right. So UX, user experience, think of it as like the overall feeling that someone gets when they're using a product. Okay. So like how I feel when I'm in that app. Yeah, exactly. Is it easy to use? Is it enjoyable? Or is it confusing, frustrating, makes you want to chuck your phone across the room right like do i want to use this again or never again <laughs> good ux you know obviously good ux is aiming for the former right we want people to enjoy using the things that we're making right yeah you want them to have a good experience exactly not be throwing phones exactly so there's ux and then there's this other one they talk about ui ui yep user interface so what's what's the difference there so that's more about the actual like visual stuff that you're interacting with on the screen. Okay. So like the buttons, the icons, you know how the whole thing is laid out visually, the colors, all that jazz. Got it. Got That's it. UI. So UX is kind of the feeling mm. and UI is the actual stuff that I see. Yes. The look and feel. Yeah. Okay. 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 And then there's uh, one more they were talking about, information architecture, IA. Ooh, yes. IA, information architecture. What is that? So... This one's all about how the content is organized and structured okay. within the app or the website or whatever. Yeah. So think of like a website's navigation menu. Okay. A good information architecture, you know, it's like a well-organized library. Okay. Everything's labeled clearly, you know, right where to go to find what you need. Right. Bad IA. That's when you're wandering around lost in the stacks forever, never finding the book you're looking for. Oh, it's like those websites where you're clicking, clicking, clicking. Yes. And you're like, wait, where am I? Exactly. Five clicks in and you have no idea how to get back to the home page. Yeah, how to get back. I just wanted to buy a sweater. Exactly. So that's bad IA. That's bad IA in action. Got it. And then the last one they talked about was interaction design. So this is about how people actually interact with the product and how the system responds to them. Okay, so like, so it's not just what it looks like, but it's like... It's like the actions. The doing stuff part. Yeah, like what happens when you click a button? Okay. Does it like change color? Is there a cool animation? You know those loading screens that tell you something's happening in the background? Right, so you know it's actually doing exactly. something. Exactly. You know, it's not just frozen. Okay. It gives you that feedback that like, hey, I'm working on it. Okay, so all of these like UX and UI and IA and interaction design, they're kind of like... Yeah. All the ingredients yeah. for like the whole digital experience. Yes. That's a perfect way to put it. Okay. They all work together. They're all important. And just like with, you know, baking, if you mess up the proportions, you leave out a key ingredient. Yeah. It's a crumbly mess. The whole thing can just totally fall flat. So yeah. you've got to get them all right. Speaking of things falling flat, Bear and Cat talk about how misunderstandings about these terms oh. can cause all kinds of friction. Yeah, classic communication breakdown. Right, between, like, designers and product managers. Yeah, designers and developers, you know, anybody on the product team, really. So is this just, like, a tech world problem? No, no. I mean, it definitely comes up a lot in the tech world. Right. But, you know, this idea of, like, different perspectives leading to conflict, that's universal, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, think about it. Designers are often laser focused on, you know, the user's experience. How does it feel? Is it intuitive? Is it beautiful? Right. And then you've got product managers who are, you know, they're thinking about deadlines. Right. The business side of things. Budgets, the business goals, all of that. And sometimes those two things, they clash, right? Yeah. So being able to communicate clearly about UX, it helps bridge that gap. Okay. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, you know, just being aware of these different perspectives is a good starting point. And then, you know, it's about learning the language. Like you said, you know, 
understanding what these terms actually mean mm -hmm. so that you can articulate what's working, what's not working, and why, okay. even if you're not a designer yourself. Yeah, so it's not just for tech people. No, no, not at all. Okay. I mean, this is for anyone who uses websites, apps, which is pretty much everybody these days. It's almost like learning another language. Totally. The language of like, yeah. good design. The language of good design, exactly. Okay. And the more fluent you are in that language, the better you can advocate for yourself and your own needs as a user, right? Right, right. Because you can say, hey, this button, it doesn't make sense where it is, or this navigation, it's totally confusing. Right. I can't find what I'm looking for. So a cat's little light bulb moment Yeah. was kind of about this. Totally. It's Brown. like once you understand the terms, you can actually start to have a real conversation about the design. And that's when things start to improve, not just for you as the user, but for everybody. Okay. So it's all about yeah. being able to like articulate the problem, articulate the solution. Yeah, and having that shared understanding so that everyone's working towards the same goal. All right, so to wrap this all up, yeah. what are our big takeaways? Yes, yeah, let's recap. Okay, so number one, clear communication. Mm -hmm, that's key. Right, especially when you're talking about digital products. Yeah, you gotta be able to speak the same language. And number two, understanding, mm -hmm. like even the basic UX terms yeah. is a huge help. It's like a superpower. It unlocks all these possibilities for having more productive conversations about design. Yeah, it's like having, yeah, like a secret weapon. Totally. So I can actually advocate for myself. Yeah. As I mean, a user, yeah. Exactly. You're not just stuck complaining about bad design. You can actually do something about it. And then finally, like, never underestimate the power mm -hmm. of just, like, casual conversations yeah. because that's where those are where the aha moments happen that's where these insights happen totally yeah, yeah. you know it's not always about formal meetings and presentations mm -hmm. right sometimes the best ideas come up when you're just chatting with someone yeah just spitballing yeah exactly okay so now here's something okay to think about all right i like it as you go about your day mm -hmm. think about an app okay or a website mm -hmm that you just, you loved using it. Yeah. It was so easy, mm -hmm. it was so smooth. What made it so good? What made it so good? Yeah. Was that the layout, was it the ease of navigation? Mm -hmm. Like, what were the things? Yeah, what were the elements that made it so enjoyable? Yeah, that made it so enjoyable. And I bet you, if you think about it, mm -hmm. a good understanding of these UX principles mm -hmm. was probably behind that great experience that you had. Yeah, yeah. So keep that in mind. Okay. Next time you're, you know, pulling your hair out over some frustrating website Early. or app, and maybe even share this newfound knowledge with a friend, you know, spread the UX gospel. All right, until next time. See ya. <laughs> okay, so imagine this. You're like prepping for a big meeting about a redesign, right? And your team just like slams you with a ton of user research data. Oh, yeah. And suddenly it's like everyone's speaking another language with all this like confidence interval and statistical significance talk. I've been there. Right. Like I've totally been there too and felt so lost. But that's exactly why we're doing this deep dive today, going into the NN glossary of quantitative UX research terms. It's like a cheat sheet for decoding all that data jargon. Yeah. And the thing is, it's not even just about like, sounding super smart in those meetings, you know? Right. Understanding all these terms can actually help you make way better design decisions and like you avoid all those common pitfalls. Totally. And it can even save you a bunch of time and resources down the road. Exactly. So let's just tackle some of these terms head on because they can sound so intimidating. Yeah, let's do it. Like confidence interval, for example. I always get tripped up by that one. What is that all about? It sounds like some kind of mystical range. Yeah. Yeah, it does sound kind of mystical, but honestly, it's pretty straightforward. Okay. Think of it like this. Um, you just ran a user survey about a new feature, right? Uh -huh. And let's say like 80% of people who answered said they loved it. Awesome. Yeah, sounds great, right? But like a confidence interval tells you how much that 80% could actually change if you had surveyed a different group of users. Oh, oh it, yeah. It's basically a reality check for your data. You know, interesting. It's saying there's always a chance of some margin of error. So it's like not just the number itself, but also how much we can actually rely on that number, right? Exactly. And that's actually where this statistical significance thing comes into play. Okay. This one basically tells us if the results we're seeing are actually because of a real effect or if it's just random chance, you know? Gotcha. Like, say you're doing A-B testing on two different versions of a button, right? Mm -hmm. And version A is getting a slightly higher click-through rate than B. Okay. 
Yeah. Statistical significance basically helps you figure out if that difference is really a big deal or if it's just a fluke. Oh, that reminds me of this one time I was working on an e-commerce site and we redesigned the whole checkout process. Mm -hmm. We saw a tiny little increase in conversions, but then it turned out it wasn't statistically significant at all. Oh, no. Yeah, we almost went ahead with this really complex implementation based on such a small blip in the data. Oh, that's a classic example of how not understanding these concepts can seriously lead you down the wrong path. For sure. And, you know, it's not even just about numbers either. Sometimes even small design changes can have a huge impact on user behavior. Totally. Understanding statistical significance can help you avoid those like really expensive mistakes. Right. And speaking of potential mistakes, another thing that always messes me up is that whole correlation versus causation thing. Oh, yeah. That's a tricky one for sure. The glossary has some really good examples for this, though. Okay. Like, just because people who use a specific feature also tend to buy more stuff doesn't mean that the feature actually made them buy more. <laughs> you know what I mean? It, it could be totally unrelated. There could be other things influencing that. Yeah, it's like that saying correlation doesn't equal causation. It's easy to look at data and think you see a pattern, but you have to be careful about assuming one thing actually caused the other. You got it. And that's why it's super important to use a bunch of different research methods, not just quantitative, but qualitative, too. Yeah. I can see that. It's about getting information from all these different places to really get a complete understanding of what's going on. Right. Like imagine you're combining data from A-B testing with user interviews to try and understand why a design change isn't doing as well as you expect it. Yeah, I love that idea because it's like getting totally different viewpoints on the same problem. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of how I actually approach design work in general. Mm -hmm. I always try to get input from like the users the developers, and even stakeholders. Yes. You know? Yes. So I can see the whole picture. Exactly. That's yeah. the key. And speaking of the big picture, think about how you can take these ideas and actually apply them to your own work. You know? What are the most important metrics for the projects you're working on right now? How can you actually use this glossary to understand the data you're seeing and make better decisions? That's a really good point. I think the big takeaway here is that we don't have to be scared of quantitative UX research. Yeah, no way. With a little bit of effort, we can all learn how to use data to make better design choices, yeah. improve user experiences, and create products that are way more successful. Absolutely. And here's a final thought for everyone. The next time you have to make a design decision, no matter how big or small, take a second to think about what data could actually help you make that decision. Okay. What metrics would be the most useful? What research methods would give you the most helpful answers? Sometimes the best insights are right there in front of us, just waiting to be discovered through a little data exploration. Very cool. Thanks for having me. Of course. This was great. It was fun. All right, everyone. Until next time, happy researching. Bye. Bye. All right. So we're back and ready for another deep dive. Yeah. And, you know, this time around, uh, we're going to be focusing on something that might sound a little bit dry at first. But trust me, it's actually super fascinating and very, very relevant, especially for you being a product designer. Mm -hmm. We're talking about uh, UX research methods. Oh, very cool. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, you sent me that awesome glossary from the Nielsen Norman group. Yeah. They're like the, the leading experts. They are. They're like the, the you know, the, the, the big dogs in the, in the UX world. Yeah, exactly. So I was going through that and there's some really interesting stuff in there. Okay, cool. Um, and we don't have to go through everything, obviously. No, no, no. Of course not. But I thought we could pick out a few things that maybe we can discuss that are particularly interesting and really relevant to what you do. Yeah, I love that. Okay, cool. Um, so one thing that really jumped out at me uh, was eye tracking. Have you have you heard much about eye tracking? I have. I actually, I think I saw a presentation once a couple years ago at a conference. Oh, cool. But yeah, I'd love to learn more about it. Yeah, me too. Yeah. It's uh, yeah, it sounds very kind of like futuristic. Right. Um, but really, it's just about understanding where people look on a screen, yeah. right? Like yes. when they're interacting with a website or an app or whatever. Exactly. And for how long and in what order, yeah. it's really, it gives you so much insight into user behavior just by tracking their eye movements. Right. It's like stuff that you wouldn't even think about. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, it's things that the users themselves aren't even conscious of. Right. Like they might be trying to find something, but their eyes are drawn to a different area of the screen for some reason. Exactly. Exactly. And that's like gold for a designer, right? Absolutely. Because then you can understand why maybe they're not seeing that button you spent so much time designing. Totally. Totally. Yeah. And I actually read somewhere uh, that 
a lot of times like important information that's tucked away like in the top right corner of a website people just completely miss it really yeah because like our eyes just don't naturally go there oh that's fascinating i know it's kind of crazy right yeah um so that's eye tracking cool um another thing i thought was super interesting and kind of related was usability testing oh yeah that's a classic yeah so i mean I guess everybody kind of knows what that is yeah. in principle, but it's really just about watching people use a product or a service. Yeah, in real time. Yeah, and seeing but, like where they get stuck, exactly. where they get frustrated. You see them struggling with something, and you're like, oh, we need to fix that. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, I'm sure you've seen this all the time as a product manager. Oh, yeah, all the time. Like you think something's going to be super intuitive. Right, and then you put it in front of a user, and they're just like completely lost. And you're like, what? what is happening yeah you think it's so obvious but it's not so it, so that's the power of usability testing right absolutely you can't you know you can't just assume you have to actually see how people are using it totally totally yeah. and it's not just about finding the problems it's also about seeing what works well what people enjoy using yeah so you can do more of that for sure for sure and then the last one i wanted to mention uh was heuristic evaluation Oh, yeah. Which is kind of interesting because it's it's not so much about observing users directly. It's more like an expert review, right? Yeah, so. exactly. It's like you have these kind of set principles of usability. Yeah, and you use these principles to evaluate a design. Right. And these principles have been developed over like years and years of research. Exactly. And the Nielsen Norman group, actually, they have a list of 10 no, really? common heuristics. Okay. Um. So, for example, one is... Visibility of system status. So users should always know what's going on. Right. right. Like, is it loading? Is it saving? Exactly. Um, another one is match between system and the real world. Hmm. So that means using language and concepts that users are familiar with. Okay. Makes sense. So you're not using all this jargon. Right. Right. That they don't understand. And this can all happen before you even have like a working prototype. Exactly. You can do this very early in the design process. Yeah, which can save you a lot of time and money later on. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, I mean... All these methods are really powerful. They are. Um, but th I guess the question is, like, how do you know which one to use? Right. Well, it depends on what you're trying to learn. Okay. And where you are in the design process. Right. So like you said earlier, heuristic evaluation is great early on because you can catch some fundamental usability problems before you even start building anything. Okay. Um, but if you're further along and you want to see how people interact with a specific feature then usability testing might be a better option. Right. And eye tracking can be really helpful for understanding user attention and behavior. Yeah. But it can be a little more expensive and time consuming. Yeah. So it really depends on your budget and your timeline as well. Totally, totally. Yeah. So, I mean, this has been like a super quick overview. Yeah. But I think it's really cool to see like how many different tools and techniques are out there. And I guess for you listening out there, you know, the question is like, if you could use one of these methods on your current project, which one would it be and why? Yeah. That's a good question to think about. Yeah, because I think each one can reveal something different. Absolutely. And really help you to create a better user experience. For sure. Cool. Well, thanks for diving into this with me. Yeah, this was fun. I always learn something new. Me too. Cool. All right. Well, until next time, happy designing. Sounds good. Bye. 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 All right. Get ready to unlock the secrets of typography. Because today, we're going deep on how the words on your screen can totally make or break a user's experience. It's way more than just making things look pretty. Yeah, for sure. Typography impacts readability, accessibility, and even a user's emotional response to a design. Right, like you wouldn't believe the difference a font can make. Absolutely. So you mentioned that you recently had a conversation with your product manager, Kat, about typography and how it sparked your curiosity. It sounds like she knows her stuff. Yeah, she does. So yeah. it looks like you've been, yeah, like sometimes it feels like going back to grade school. It is a little bit, right. But honestly, these terms, as basic as they are, are really essential for designers to grasp. They are super important because, I mean, think about it. If you're designing a button for a mobile app and you choose a font that has a really high ascender, uh -huh. it might look really elegant on a desktop, you know, where you have a lot of space. But on a small screen, that ascender could easily get cut off, oh, so... making the button label unreadable. Yeah. And then suddenly... A seemingly small typographic detail becomes a huge usability nightmare. Exactly. It can have a huge impact. So how do we, I guess, avoid these kinds of pitfalls? 
how do we ensure that our typography is actually helping and not hindering the user experience? Yeah, that's where readability and legibility come into play. Okay, and those are two terms that people, I think, use interchangeably. All the time. But they actually have distinct meanings. Yes. So can you break those down for us? Sure. So readability is all about how easily we can read longer chunks of text. So think like a blog post or an article. Right, right. And it's affected by things like line height, letter spacing, and text alignment. Yeah, it's so true. Yeah. I think about the last time I tried to read like a really long article on my phone. Oh, yeah. And if the line height is wrong or it's just like there's no breathing room. It's a nightmare. Your eyes get so tired. Yeah. And you just give up, you know. You just can't even. Yeah. And then on the other hand, you have legibility. Okay. And that focuses more on individual characters being easily distinguishable. Right. So like, is that a capital I? Or a lowercase l. Exactly, yeah. Or, like, is that a zero or the letter O? Oh, my gosh, yes. I hate that when I can't tell. Especially in, like, a password field, and you're like, is this? I know. So choosing fonts with really clear letter forms is super key here. Absolutely. And again, you know, proper spacing and alignment play a role. Makes me think about accessibility, too. Yeah. You know, how do we make sure that our typography is inclusive for users with visual impairments or dyslexia? That's such an important consideration, and the Nielsen-Norman group really stresses the importance of things like sufficient font size. Of course. Having good contrast between the text and the background, and avoiding excessive use of italics, or all caps. Right. These can all make reading incredibly difficult for some users. It all comes back to empathy, doesn't it? It really does. Just putting ourselves in the shoes of different users and really thinking about how the choices that we make are impacting their experience. Absolutely. And here's where it gets really interesting. Typography is not just about functionality. It's also about evoking emotions and conveying brand personality. Like choosing the right outfit for the occasion. Right. Exactly. You wouldn't wear a tuxedo to a beach party. Exactly. So, I mean, how do we do that with typography? Well, think about it this way. A serif font, like Times New Roman, often feels very traditional, authoritative, even academic. Right. Whereas a sans serif font like Helvetica, often comes across as very clean, modern, and minimalist. It's true. And these associations, these like feelings that we get from different typefaces, they can really influence how users perceive a product. So like if I was designing an app for a yoga studio, yeah, you know, I might lean towards a sans serif font, maybe with some rounded edges. Oh, yeah. To convey that sense of calmness and flow. Exactly. Whereas if I was designing for a financial institution, I might choose a bold, maybe serif font to project stability and confidence. Totally. Every typographic choice contributes to the overall message and feeling of your design. It's such a powerful tool. I mean, this has been an incredibly insightful deep dive. I'm glad you think so. So as you continue working on your designs, I really want to encourage you to think about the message that you want to convey, not just with the words themselves, but how those words are presented. You make all the difference. What typographic choices can you make to create a seamless and engaging experience for your users? That's something to really think about. Absolutely. Well, that wraps up our deep dive into the world of typography. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. All right, so welcome back for another deep dive. Uh, today, we are gonna be uh, looking at something that I think is pretty cool. I think you're gonna find it pretty cool too. It's UX deliverables. Ooh, deliverables. Deliverables, yeah. Have you ever heard of that? I mean, I'm sure you've heard of it. Oh yeah, I mean, it's what we do. Yeah, it's kind of what you do, and I guess it's kind of what I do too. Yeah, we're in the thick of it. We're in the thick of it, so yeah. we should know about it. But uh, you know, when we say deliverables, I mean, we're talking about all those documents and designs and you know all the reports that UX designers put together. Yeah. Um, to, you know, really make these apps and websites we use every day uh, so intuitive, so easy to use, so enjoyable. Yeah, and it's all that thought that goes into it. You don't really realize it until you start thinking about it. Yeah. I mean, how many times you just pick up an app and start using it, and you're like, oh, this is really easy. And you don't think twice about it? You don't think twice about it, yeah. but there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes. Behind the scenes, yeah. So that's what we're going to kind of pull back the curtain on today. Yeah, peek behind the curtain. Um, And... uh you know, this is going to be particularly helpful, I think, for anyone who is, you know, actually involved in making digital products. Mm -hmm. Like, if you are a product designer, mm -hmm. a product manager, or really anyone in between, mm -hmm. I think this is going to be really helpful. You know, you always hear about wireframes and prototypes, but, like, how does it all fit together? Exactly. Yeah, it's a whole orchestra. It's kind of like an orchestra. Yeah, it's like 
every instrument has to play its part and they all have to come together in this like beautiful symphony beautiful symphony yeah, yeah. of user experience right um so let's uh let's kind of break it down a little bit and you know maybe start from the beginning like all right yeah we've got this idea for a new app or a new website or a new feature or whatever it is right where do we start we got to start with the users we start with the users you know and, and understanding who they are and what they need yeah. and okay so how do we do that well that's where these user personas come in you know it's not just like demographics right. it's like really richly detailed characters that represent your different types of users yeah. and you give them names and you know figure out what their behaviors are their needs their frustrations even you know with existing products it's like you're writing a character it is it's like a movie it's like a movie yeah so you really step into their shoes and try to experience the product through their eyes oh i see which really helps you design with empathy and know. avoid making assumptions you know like well, I would use it this way. Yeah, well, I would do it like this. Right. But, you know, other people are different. Other people are different. Yeah. So that's what the persona's for. That's what the persona's for. Okay. So we got our persona now. What? So now that we understand who we're designing for, we have to map out how they'll actually use the product. Okay. And that's where the user journey maps come in. User journey maps. Mm hmm All right. Tell mm -hmm. me more about that. So these are like visual representations that map out every single step a user takes from like the moment they encounter a product to the moment they achieve their goal. Oh, wow. So it's like a flow chart, but specifically focused on the user. Mm. Like imagine ordering food online. Yeah. So the journey map would show every step from searching for a restaurant to browsing the menu, adding items to their cart, the checkout process, receiving the delivery confirmation, you know, the whole thing. Oh, wow. So it really is like every little step. Every little step. And I guess by mapping it out, you can kind of see where... You can see the pain points. The pain points are... Yeah, you know, is the menu hard to navigate? <laughs> yeah. Is the checkout process confusing? Is it asking me to log in when I don't want to log in? Right, exactly. Yeah. So seeing those pain points early can be super helpful. I bet. Because then designers can jump in and smooth out the whole experience. Okay, so we've got the persona, we've got the journey map. Now we're starting to get into like- The actual design. The design, yeah. so what's next? So now we're talking wireframes. Wireframes. Okay, I've heard this word. You've heard of it. I've heard of it, what is it? So these are like the blueprints of your digital product. Okay. They show the skeletal structure, the layout, before you get into any like visual detail. So like, is it gonna be blue or red or green? Right, exactly. It's like black and white almost. Uh -huh. Very basic. Gotcha. Um, but it helps you figure out the information architecture, how users will interact with different elements on the page. So really function over form at this point. Exactly. Okay. We're not worried about making it pretty, yet we're just focused on making it work. Make it work, yeah. And once we have our wireframes, then we can move on to prototypes. Ah, prototypes. Now we're getting to the fun stuff. Yeah, this is where things get interactive. Right. So prototypes are basically simulations of the final product. Okay. And they allow you to actually click through different screens test out different interactions and get feedback early on. So it's not just like a static picture. No, it's interactive. Oh, cool. And this is super important because it's way easier to catch and fix issues at the prototype stage than it is after you've already launched the product. I can imagine. Think of it like a test drive before buying a car. Makes sense. You don't want to buy a lemon. No, you don't want to buy a lemon. So you test it out first okay. and make sure everything's running smoothly. So you do the test drive and then what? And when you take it to the mechanic. You take it to the mechanic. That's kind of like the usability testing phase. Okay. Where you have real users interact with your prototype and you observe how they use it, what they struggle with, what works well. So this is where you kind of get that feedback. Yes, exactly. And all those insights are compiled into a usability report. A usability report. Which is basically a detailed debrief of what happened during those user testing sessions. Okay, so it's like being a fly on the wall. Yes, exactly. During these user testing sessions. Getting all the raw, unfiltered insights. Okay. And those insights are pure gold for the design team. I bet, yeah. Because they can take all that feedback and use it to iterate on the design and make it even better. So this is where it all kind of comes together. It does. Like you get that feedback and then you go back and you... You tweak it, you fix it. You tweak it, you fix it, yeah. You make it better. All right, so we've gone through the whole process now, right? Well, almost. Almost. Okay, what's missing? Well, we need to make sure everything is consistent and visually appealing. Okay, yeah. You don't want it to be all over the place. Right. Different colors, different fonts, different 
You need that consistency. Yeah. And that's where style guides come in. Style guides. These yeah. are like the guardians of the brand's visual identity. Oh. They outline everything from the color palette and the typography to like button styles, iconography, you know, all those visual details. I see. And it ensures that no matter where you are in the app or website, whether you're on the home page or like deep within a specific feature, everything feels cohesive and on brand. It's kind of like a rule book for the designers. Yeah, basically. Like, don't use this color. Use this font. Exactly. Keep exactly. it consistent. Gotcha. Gotcha. So all of this together, you know, the persona, the journey map, the wireframe, the prototype, the usability report, the style guide. That's what makes up the UX deliverables. That's what makes up the UX deliverables. And they all work together. They all work together. To create that amazing user experience. That's so cool. I never really thought about all the pieces that kind of go into this. It's a whole process. It's a whole process. Yeah, it's really fascinating. Yeah. So now that you know a little bit more about this process, maybe when you pick up your phone and you open up an app, Yeah. think about all the work that went into it. All the people. All the people. All the hours. Our thoughts. The thought, yeah. All those deliverables. All those deliverables, yeah. So if you want to learn more about this stuff, um, there's a whole glossary of UX deliverables on the NN Group's website. I'll put a link in the show notes. Yeah. It's a great resource. Yeah. So go check that out and uh, we'll see you next time for another deep dive. See ya. Bye. All right. So uh, I think it's time for another deep dive. You ready? I am ready to dive in. Okay. Awesome. So Bear, uh, you know, you were telling me about this conversation you had with Kat yeah. about visual design and how it impacts usability. Yeah. I was like, oh man, we have to dig into that. You know, this is like perfect timing, right? Yeah. Because we have this article right here. Fresh from the Nielsen Norman Group. And for those who haven't heard of them, they are like the gurus of usability. They know their stuff. They do. So this article digs deep into visual design principles for interfaces. And I'm thinking it might give you some ammo for your next chat with Kat, you know? <laughs> Maybe even help settle the debate on aesthetics versus usability. Yeah, for sure. Cool. So uh, right off the bat, like in the first few lines, the article hits us with this statement. Visual design is more than aesthetics. When used correctly, it can make interfaces easier to understand. Yeah. I mean, it's so simple, but it's kind of like, whoa, yeah. Yeah, right? Like, yeah. that's kind of the foundation of it all. It is. Like, why is that so important? Why is it so important for an interface to be visually designed in a way that makes it easy to understand? Well, I think you have to think about the user, right? Yeah. If a user is struggling to figure out how to use an interface or they can't find what they're looking for, it's just frustrating, right? Yeah. They're going to leave. They're going to go somewhere else. Bounce right out. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So good visual design, it really guides the user and makes the experience smooth and intuitive, right? It's almost like you're holding their hand, but in like a very subtle non-creepy way yeah 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 exactly it's like an invisible hand like then. a design jedi mind trick exactly this is the button you were looking for <laughs> okay so to break it down a bit the article digs into four main areas right clarity emphasis unity and personality yeah so let's start with clarity right, right. making sure users can actually see and understand what's in front of them why is clarity even more crucial in a digital space as opposed to, say, like a brick and mortar store or something. Okay, so imagine you walk into a store, right? Yeah. You can wander around, look at things, pick them up. You get a feel for the place. Totally. You can even, like, smell the candles or whatever. And, and if you can't find something, you can ask for help. There's an actual human to guide you. Yeah, exactly. You can just, like, flag someone down. Where are the bath bombs? <laughs> yeah, but online, you're yeah. completely reliant on what you see on the screen. That's it. So if design is cluttered, the text is tiny, or the navigation's hidden, you know, buried somewhere. Yeah. That's a recipe for disaster. People will just leave. Yeah. They're gone. Gone. Huh. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Hmm. So moving on to emphasis, and I'm already thinking like websites with those big, bold buy now buttons hmm. that just scream at you. Mm. Is that kind of what we're talking about here? Using visual cues to like spotlight what's important? Yeah, that's a perfect example. It's about using things like size, color, contrast to draw the eye where it needs to go. It's like saying, hey, look here. This is the most important thing. So, for example, you know, on a form, you want to make that submit button really obvious so people don't miss it. So you want to make sure it's not the same size and color as like the cancel button. Yeah, exactly. So, you want to guide them, make it super clear what to do next. So it's almost like establishing a visual hierarchy, like this is the most important thing, mm -hmm. then this, then this. Exactly. Okay. Cool. 
And then that leads us to unity, which, as I understand it, is all about consistency, having a cohesive look and feel throughout the entire interface. Yeah, yeah. So think about it like this. Imagine a brand you really trust. Okay. They have a specific look, right? Certain fonts they always use, a color palette. Maybe they have a very specific style of photography. Right. This consistency is super important. It builds familiarity. Yeah. yeah. It makes the brand recognizable. Oh, yeah. And it makes the user feel more comfortable, like they know what to expect. So it's not just about aesthetics. It's about, like, building trust. Exactly. It's deeper than just making it look pretty. It's about creating a cohesive experience. Okay, I'm getting it. Good. And now, finally, we get to the fun part. Personality. Uh, yes. This is where I always get a little stuck, you know? Yeah. Like, how do you inject personality into a design without it becoming, like, cheesy? Yeah, it's a delicate balance for sure. You don't want to go overboard. Think subtle touches, little things that make a difference. Okay. Like a fun micro interaction. Ooh. I love those. Yeah. Something delightful that happens when a user completes a task. Or using illustrations that reflect the brand's tone of voice. It's about making the interface memorable, but in a good way. Yeah, you want it to be memorable, not memeable. Exactly. So, you know, Bear, as we're talking about all of this, I'm picturing you and Kat having this very same conversation, you know? Yeah. Even if you weren't using these specific terms like clarity or unity. Oh, absolutely. You were probably debating how to make the navigation clear or how to used visuals to like guide users through a specific workflow. Right. And maybe Kat was pushing for something bolder, you yeah. know, something that really grabs the user's attention. Yeah. And you're advocating for a more minimalist approach, prioritizing clarity over flash. Exactly. It's funny how these principles are always at play, even if we don't realize it, you know? Totally. And that's what makes design so fascinating, right? There's always more to learn, more to explore. So much depth. So, Bear, before we wrap up, I'm going to leave you with a little challenge, okay? Why don't you pick one of these principles? Maybe clarity, since it seems like you and Kat have some differing opinions on that one. Yeah. And really focus on it in your current project. Okay. Just see how even small changes can affect how users interact with your design. Remember, it's all about testing and iterating. Love it. Thanks. Yeah. Have fun with it. Okay, bye. Bye. Bye.